Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing antithrombin-3 and heparin. Okay, so uh, we are now going to revise the coagulation cascades, both the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation cascade, so that we can understand what antithrombin-3 is going to do, because it's going to inhibit a whole bunch of the uh, coagulation factors, and if we don't haven't seen the coagulation pathways, then it's just going to be meaningless. Okay, so we need to look at the coagulation cascades. So, we'll begin with the intrinsic coagulation cascade. Okay, right, so turn over. So, the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. Okay, so this is going to be activated when um, a certain clotting factor, which is within the blood, meets collagen. Okay, so let me explain. So, usually, the constituents of the blood do not see any collagen. All they see is the other constituents of the blood and the apical surfaces of the endothelial cells. They do not see anything else. However, when you have a cut in the side of your blood vessel, so I'll redraw this picture again. So, here is our blood vessel seen from the side, and we've got this great big hole in the side of our blood vessel. Okay, so the blood would be moving, let's say, in this direction here. Okay, so here's our blood vessel, and we've got this hole in the side of our blood vessel. Now, basically, when you've got this hole, all of this other stuff is going to be exposed to the constituents of the blood, because the blood is going to start coming through here, and basically, now it's going to see a whole new um, um, array of um, molecules and of cells, and one of the molecules, one of the key proteins that it's going to see is collagen, okay? So all over the place, we know if we recite our structure of the blood vessel, we have our endothelial cells here, okay? Then underneath them, so they're the endothelial cells. Underneath them, we know there is the uh, basement membrane, okay, which is mainly made up of collagen. There are other proteins in it other than collagen, but one of the main constituents is collagen. Then underneath that, we've got the subendothelial space, which is this, um, this layer of collagen here, okay? So the point is that you know, the, the constituents of the blood are going to come and see this exposed collagen now, and they're going to be activated by it. Now, which coagulation factor is initially activated by collagen? Well, there is a coagulation factor circulating in the blood, which is known as factor 12, okay? So, usually in the blood, there is this coagulation factor or clotting factor 12. And I'm going to drop the factor, I'm just going to use the Roman numerals now, because otherwise it's going to get kind of tiring to continuously write out factor. Okay, so this is factor 12, and factor 12 also has another quite pervasive name, so I think you need to know it. So, it's also referred to as Hageman factor, okay? Uh, and you will hear that referred to, so it's not totally unheard of to hear this called Hageman factor. So, factor 12, or Hageman factor, is a normal constituent of the blood. All of us will have factor 12 within our blood, okay? Now, it only becomes active when it sees collagen, and it should not usually see collagen. Unless uh, there is a hole in the side of a blood vessel, then it will not see collagen. So when it, there is a hole in the side of the blood vessel, what's going to happen is that factor 12 is going to be activated to factor 12A, which just means the activated form of factor 12, or you would call this activated Hageman factor if you were um, wishing to use the Hageman factor name. Okay, so activated Hageman factor. So we have this enzyme which has been activated by exposure to collagen, which is now exposed due to the hole in the side of the blood vessel. So collagen did this. Okay, now what's going to happen is a whole cascade, unfortunately. The simple thing would be if factor 12A now just converted fibrinogen into fibrin. Unfortunately, it's not like that. There's a whole bunch of intermediates, uh, so it sets up a whole cascade, but try not to get lost in this. Try to remember the big picture, that all we are effectively doing 
is having collagen that is exposed uh, on the surface of this cut here um, activate the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Now it goes through a whole bunch of separate proteins, but remember that that's the big picture, that collagen, the exposed collagen, is going to activate coagulation, basically. Okay, so now let's do the pathway, and the reason I'm going to put you through this is because antithrombin-3 targets a huge number of the proteins that are within this pathway, so we need to know their names, otherwise when I just list them off it's going to be completely meaningless if you don't know where they are in terms of coagulation. Right, so, factor 12A now acts on another coagulation factor within the blood, okay, so it's going to activate another enzyme. So it's been activated by collagen, and now the activated form of 12 is going to activate the 11 enzyme, okay? So in the blood there is a factor 11, and once factor 12 has been activated, it will undergo a reaction which activates factor 11 to factor 11A. Okay, right. Then, factor 11 will activate another coagulation factor. So it's going to activate coagulation factor 9. Okay, so here comes coagulation factor 9. So you start off with the inactive form of coagulation factor 9, and you convert it to the active factor 9. And all of these coagulation factors, by the way, they're all produced in the liver, they all circulate in their inactive forms, and then once collagen has been exposed, it sets off this entire cascade where one is activated, it activates the next, it activates the next, etc. Now, 9A is then going to activate factor 10, however, it's not going to do it alone. It requires a cofactor, basically. So there's another coagulation factor that has to uh, bind on to factor 9A in order for factor 9A to actually be activated. Okay, so factor 9A is the main enzyme, but it cannot work without another protein sticking on the side and forming a protein complex. And this is the factor 8A. So let me just draw a picture of this so that you understand what a cofactor is. So if we have our enzyme here, okay, let's say this is the active site of the enzyme, okay, so this is the active site, so you might wonder what's this other little site you've made over here? Well this is for the binding of a cofactor, okay, so I'll highlight the cofactor in turquoise here. So this is the main enzyme, okay, which will catalyze the reaction. However, the enzyme is not active until you have bound this other little protein onto it. And this other little protein that you're going to bind onto the enzyme to activate it is a cofactor. Okay, so you activate 9 to 9A. So 9A is this enzyme that's nearly ready to work, but then to make 9A actually work, you then have to bind 8A on. So there's two processes of activation, really. 9 needs to firstly be activated by... Um, uh, 11 here, and then it needs also to act have factor 8A bind to it to um, become the full active enzyme. And we'll talk about factor 8A in a moment, because you might be wondering, well, where does factor 8A come from? And I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, so then what's going to happen is that this complex here is then going to activate factor 10. Okay, so the Roman numeral for factor 10 is just an X, like so, so here's 10, and 10 will be converted to 10A. So 10A has now been, well, 10 has now been activated to 10A. Now, uh, 10A is then going to activate, finally, factor 2, and I told you that factor 2 had a, was so important that it had been given another name. Like factor 1 has been renamed fibrinogen, uh, factor 2 has been renamed prothrombin. However, before we talk about the activation of prothrombin, we need to talk about the fact that 10A, just like 9A, is not a complete enzyme, so it needs a cofactor to come and bind to it. And the cofactor that comes and binds to 10A is 5A. And again, this is agonizing, because 8A and 5A, where, the, where did they come from? Um, okay, the rest of it makes sense, but where did these two come from? And I'll talk about that in a moment.
Okay, so 10A binds with 5A, and together that forms a functional enzyme complex, which is then going to convert factor 2, or prothrombin. Okay, so you're more likely to hear this um, called uh, prothrombin now than factor 2. But again, I'll call it factor 2 just so that you know what factor 2 actually is, because you might wonder, where is factor 2? Why is there no factor 2? Okay, and when you activate prothrombin, it's then referred to as the enzyme thrombin, and this would also be referred to as factor 2A. Okay, right. So, 10A together with 5A will activate prothrombin to thrombin. Right, now, thrombin is going to activate factor 8 and factor 5, so it leads to the production of these two. And you might think, what? But they were needed for the production of thrombin. Right, so, in the blood, there will always be a tiny, absolutely tiny amount of activated factor 5 and activated factor 8. You can't completely stop the activation of these factors. Okay, so there will be a tiny amount. So, when you set off this pathway by activating factor 12 or Hageman factor with collagen, then uh, you get factor 12A. Factor 12A converts factor 11 to factor 11A. 11A converts 9 to 9A. Now, this 9A that you've produced, you've produced a massive amount of 9A. Now, what will happen is this tiny amount of, well, sorry, this massive amount of 9A, a tiny amount of that massive amount of 9A will be able to bind to this tiny amount of 8A that was already there. Okay, so 8A will then bind to 9A, and you'll get a tiny little bit of active enzymes initially. Okay, this will then activate a tiny amount of 10 to 10A, which will bind to this tiny amount of 5A, and will convert a tiny amount of prothrombin to thrombin. However, you're then going to get a positive feedback, because thrombin will lead to higher levels of 5A and 8A. Okay, so now this pathway can proceed much faster. So now this large amount of 11A we had from the exposed collagen will now have a much uh, larger amount of 8A to play with, so you'll get a much larger number of active enzymes, which means that you'll convert much more 10 into 10A. And now this 10A has got loads of 5A, so you'll get loads of conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. So the whole thing has this positive feedback loop. Okay, right. So the other thing that thrombin does is that it converts fibrinogen into fibrin. Okay, so it's going to catalyze the conversion of fibrinogen, or remember, fibrinogen is also known as factor 1, okay, so coagulation factor 1. It's going to convert fibrinogen, whoops, that's a horrible smudge, into fibrin, okay, which is also referred to as factor 1A. Right, and then what's going to happen is that another enzyme known as factor 13A, okay, so what's going to catalyze this reaction? It's going to be 13A. Okay, 13A is going to catalyze the conversion of fibrin, or factor 1A, into fibrin strands. Okay, so this is how exposed collagen uh, on the surface of the whole, basically, is going to activate the coagulation cascade, which will lead to the production of fibrin strands. And this whole cascade will be happening in amongst the uh, platelet aggregate that you've formed already. And therefore, in amongst the platelets, you'll get loads of fibrin strands being produced. And a fancy bit of terminology is to call this fibrin deposition, okay? So you'll get fibrin deposition amongst the uh, platelet aggregates, and this will make that platelet aggregate structure, which we call the primary platelet plug, or a primary hemostatic plug, it will make it far stronger, okay, and it will turn it into a secondary hemostatic plug. Okay, so this is the intrinsic coagulation cascade. In the next video, what we'll do is look at the extrinsic coagulation cascade. So there is another pathway, basically, which can also lead to the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Okay, but it, instead of being activated by collagen, is activated by tissue factor. Okay, but we'll discuss that in the next video.